Hello friends, it's Kayla. This is my very late February wrap up. Apologies for that. I don't know how many books I read. I'll pop the number up here. They're just stacked in front of me in a way that I can't really see them instead of behind me for once because there's so many of them. And you'd think that my wrap up being late would give me time to count them and that I would be really prepared. <laughs> but of course I'm not. Oh man, let me tell you, life lately. Um, I asked you on Instagram not specific questions this time, but how you think I should organize my wrap up because I always do something odd. And this time, a bunch of people were saying that I should organize it by like worst first line to best first line. And I thought that would be so fun. As someone who doesn't really care about the first line in a book, like I don't find it does much for me. I don't really remember the first lines. I don't know the first lines of like my favorite books. I just thought I would take an extra look at them all this morning and rank them, which definitely led to an interesting organization because my worst first line is a five star book and my best first line ended up being a one-star book. So let's begin with Recitative by Toni Morrison. The first line of this, well, there's half of this book is an introduction by Zadie Smith, and it starts out, in 1980, Toni Morrison sat down to write her one and only short story, Recitative. <laughs> I just mean, as far as first lines go, it's a pretty dull one. It's just a pretty obligatory one. Maybe I should give it a fair shot. Maybe I'm about to apologize. The actual first line of recitative is my mother danced all night and Roberta was sick. Which also doesn't actually do that much for me. Recitative is about two characters, Twilight and Roberta, and they are re reflecting on their life together growing up in this shelter. Um, they both come from diff difficult situations and they encounter each other multiple times throughout their adult life. And a lot of the conversations come back to race and how race um, played a big part in you know, what they went through. But you don't know the races of the characters throughout the book. You know one of them is black and one of them is white. Um, but it's kind of like an experimental thing that Toni Morrison did where she relies on the reader's like prejudices and assumptions um, and things like that to tell her story. And I just think it's so fascinating. I don't know that I would have given Recitative as a standalone five stars without the introduction from Zadie Smith but it was such a it was more of like a book review um and it told me everything that was to come in the story and I thought it by the end of it I was like oh god I just read the whole book but by the very end I was like I don't think it would have been as impactful without that introduction and me being given Zadie Smith's analysis of why this book works so well I think it's such an interesting idea how like the girls perspectives mirror our perspectives as the book goes on because there's one main event um one thing that happened to a woman in their childhood and they both remember that woman differently as well as far as race so there comes a point in the story where you're realizing the twyla and roberta are doing the same thing that you're doing as a reader which is just like thinking about the wrong things, caring about the wrong things, and your focus is on like wondering the race of this person, but like that's not the point of the story. It is the point of the story, but it's not the point of the story story. It truly is one of the shortest short stories I've ever read, like this is it. I just thought it was really interesting. Uh, next book is Hamlet by Shakespeare. Feels wrong for it to be in the second slot here just because it is a five star and always will be. But the first line of this is like a stage direction, which is enter Barnardo and Francisco, two sentinels. And like, can you get more dull than that? Hamlet has some of the best written monologues, like Hamlet himself has some of the best monologues in Shakespeare's work. Like it's always a delight to come back to. It was a really good time. I don't think I have any like new thoughts since the last time I read Hamlet. It's a story of revenge. It's a story of power. Um, Hamlet avenging the death of his father and everything that comes after that. All of the characters so interestingly reflect Hamlet, different aspects of his personality. And it's just a really fun one to like study. I think I had more fun like talking this through in high school than just reading on my own but it's still like 
obviously an objective five star for me. Next up we have If I Disappear by Eliza Jane Brazier. And, oh, I was gonna read you the synopsis instead of the first line. What is the first line? Every morning when I wake up to the cries of the baby next door, I turn you on. Which is like a weird sentence. Um, and it is related to her turning on a podcast. And she's kind of telling the story to this woman who she feels really close to because she listens to her all the time in her podcast true crime um this woman rachel so she's like talking to rachel and in this book rachel goes missing and what's her main character's name sarah uh she goes on a mission to find out what happened to rachel but what happened to rachel is like spoiled in the synopsis even though it's supposed to be a reveal like at the end it's it's very strange um it's more so just like a woman living on a farm quietly pondering to herself where this woman is it's not very interesting it's not very engaging it doesn't have any interesting reveals or twists and i thought the podcast element would be far more of a portion than just these tiny little excerpts overall it was a two star for me it turned out to not be what i was expecting and even with what it was I couldn't enjoy it. Next up, we've got Vampires Never Get Old, Tales with Fresh Bite, which is a great way to describe it because this is, um, how many? Oh, it doesn't tell me. I don't want to count them. Let's say 15 stories, 12 to 15 stories that take a new look on vampires, um, the vampires that a lot of, you know, from history have been written in a certain way and exist in a certain world and these stories definitely subvert certain expectations and fresh bite basically implies that there are more opportunities than just the stories we're used to where you know people with characters with disabilities characters of color uh, queer characters can also have you know, their moment in the monster world. My favorite in here was by Rebecca Roanhorse, which is a real treat because I've always enjoyed her writing. And now I know that I can also enjoy a short story, which just is fun to know. Um, Kayla Whaley, who I've read quite a few short stories from before, I think. A lot of these actually ended up being three stars. So I think overall I have to rate this a three star, but the first line, apologies. I mean, the first line of the introduction is a note from your edit tricks And then the first line of the first story, Esmail told me that teenage girls make the best vampires, which describes the book, but isn't particularly intriguing. Uh, next up, we have Black Chalk by Christopher J. Yates, which was a four star for me. And I put it in this position because the first line is, he phones early. So like, okay. This is basically a dark game kind of book. It doesn't get quite as dark as it could, um, but it's set at Oxford University. A group of six students play an elaborate game of dares. So there's like this card gambling kind of game that they play, play that isn't fully described in the book. But what it leads to is if you lose or win or whatever, um, you then have to complete dares. And the dares get more, not dangerous, but like, exploitive i guess mortifying perhaps and then we're following this guy and 14 years later he's clearly like not dealing with the situation well and having a reunion with the people who played the game because he's just like locked himself inside and he has a series of rituals he goes through every day to like keep himself safe and it's just an interesting untangling of webs to figure out why he's in this position and how the game is like currently still kind of ongoing it's a slow quiet story it's not like this action-packed game and it's not like this big scene where like all of these characters come back together but he's slowly like introducing us to different players and i thought it was fascinating and i gave it four stars but it's interesting how like i've lost a lot of the actual plot in the recesses of my mind so i'm not sure that one like holds up in my memory as a four star but i'm gonna move on to my next four star which is somebody's daughter a memoir by ashley c ford the first line of this is in quotes just remember you can always come home 
So I think that gives you an interesting feel for the story. It's not like super intriguing, but it's a nonfiction. So it's kind of an anticipated tone for a first line. But we're following Ashley through a series of vignettes. She lets us in on her life and the direction her life has gone because of the way she was raised. Um, there are very interesting interactions with her mother throughout the book where um, sometimes they have a good relationship, sometimes they don't, and it's like a confusing thing for a child to grapple with, understandably. Her father's been incarcerated, but she doesn't know the full story of why he's there. Um, and once she does discover that, she has to figure out her feelings about that and um, grapple with her own set of circumstances that she's been through like within her relationships and there are themes of like forgiveness and loneliness. She deals with a lot of things that just women in the society deal with um, but she writes it in a really compelling way and then she deals with a lot of things that nobody should ever go through and really lets you into her life and I think that's such a brave thing. Next up we've got a five star, Leave the World Behind by Ruman Alam. And the first line of this is, well, the sun was shining. So another just like fact-based intro that doesn't feel like a lot, but it's actually a good setup for this particular story because it's an apocalyptic scenario, but you don't really learn about the apocalypse at any point. You learn about the mundane activities of this family who are staying on vacation in this Airbnb and the family who owns the home comes back and they're like, the world is ending, um, let us stay back in our house. Like you can stay too, but like we need to be somewhere safe. This was a five star for me because I think this book knew exactly what it wanted to do. And a critique of some books that you will hear from me soon are that I don't think the book had direction. I don't think the book knew what it wanted to be. Um, but this had such clear intent. Whether you enjoy that or not is up for debate because this is a super lowly rated book. In fact, quite a few books from this video um, I filmed in this video where I read the lowest rated books on my TBR and like explored if my perspective differs from other people. And this one was definitely the one that I disagree the most with because I just think it's so fascinating the way that this author set up this book and doesn't describe what you think he's going to describe. And you spend the entire book wondering, why am I reading about this? Why am I learning about this? It's as if you're in a movie, you're watching a movie, and you hear a sound, and you never get to learn what the origin of that sound was. <laughs> or imagine there are like characters talking and then suddenly the movie like mutes, so you don't get to learn what they're talking about. But then you watch them in a series of clips like tying their shoes, and pouring their cereal, and looking out the window. As if the camera's pointed at the closet, and the closet starts to open and then the camera pans away and then never comes back to the closet. It's like an infuriating read and I think it's so cool because it, I mean, it could be, and I feel like it has this implication of humanity and that humans are so self-serving and self-obsessed that rather than us ever learning about how the world is ending and what's going on. We're just hearing the inner thoughts of characters and this self-obsession. It's just so cool. I only recently learned this is being adapted and I don't understand how or what it's even gonna be because describing the plot of this is so difficult, but it was such a fascinating time. Next up on the opposite side of the spectrum and what I was just talking about with a book that I don't think knows what it's doing um, it's Cherish Farah by Bethany C. Morrow, which I feel so terrible about. One, because I've loved a book from her in the past, that's why I wanted to pick this up. Um, two, because it's social horror and I've recently really gotten into social horror. I find myself like wanting to defend myself when I'm talking about this. Like Lakewood, Reprieve, social horror, it's slow. Like I get it. I thought I would get it, but I don't get it. Not only do I not get it, I don't get the people who get it. There are so many books that I rate lowly. This was one star. 
And when I see people rating things five stars that I rated lowly, I'm like, okay, it just wasn't for me. Like, I understand why other people could like this. It's a book. People have different thoughts on books. This one, I don't think I understand. I think the vibes it was trying to give was like swim fan, black swan, get out. Okay? But it did not give those things effectively. Uh, first line of this one was I'm sitting in a bedroom with the kind of vaulted ceiling I wanted in my own in a house much larger and more extravagant than the one I can't go back to and the fact that I can't enjoy it upsets me and I actually enjoyed the first chapter of this book I thought it was intriguing we're following two girls um, who are so close like have been close forever um, they get mistaken for each other they're just like best friends um and one of them has been adopted by a white couple and the other one goes to move in with her family when her family like isn't able to take care of her or whatever um and she is a very like manipulative character that's what the synopsis tells me and that's what other people's reviews tell me um i'm not going off of my own actual feelings about this book people say it is a toxic friendship people say it is a dark atmospheric story bad things are supposedly happening to her it's supposedly a dangerous situation but the tone was just off like i'm sorry and there are a couple moments in that first chapter where things are seemingly fine and then someone will say something a little like dark and you're like okay weird vibes but then like that's the tone for the whole book the book has no subtlety it's very on the nose just like everyone thinks everything is fine but actually this person feels very dark this person feels like they're in control this person is trying to be manipulative but it's just a very exhausting perspective to read from i don't think we really learn much throughout the entire book it's just like the same scene over and over again besides like some interesting commentary about class and privilege um this book uh, there was nothing like going for it for me i think she had an interesting idea for the ending um but the ending flopped and i don't think she knew how she even wanted to get to the ending and didn't really care how to get to the ending and therefore just kept telling the same scenes over and over again this was absolutely absurd and not in a good way i think um, Farah's inner monologue and her reactions and her feelings wanted to feel warranted but they just felt absurd and then the author like really spoils the ending about a third of the way into the book it was a whole mess I don't know how it could have been improved for me maybe if it was a short story but some people like it so I'm happy for them the next one that was sent to me is Ophelia after all by Raquel Marie and this one have I rated this? I think this is a 4.5. It's almost a 5. Um, the thing that makes it not a full 5 is just like a little heavy-handed in the descriptions of identity, but I can forgive that because of the age range that I'm clearly not the target audience. The first line of this is, the fabric of my lilac gown brushes my bare legs, sending shivers of delightful anticipation up my arms. It's just a simple descriptive sentence but it is it flows nicely um this is about a girl who like loves flowers and wants to be a botanist and it's very sweet um it is very shakespeare inspired and i love that if you're generally versed in hamlet i think you can see the ties obviously but the more shakespeare you've read the more like little moments you can recognize which is just so fun as a reader like i've talked about before i'm reading less and less ya contemporary these days um so it feels good that the one that i read this entire month was a big win this isn't a romance though it looks romantic it's about like self-love and self-acceptance there are lots of relationships in here um it's mostly about friendship uh there's a lot of like little friendship drama um relationships and queer identity is at the forefront um and grappling with wanting to be your authentic self but ophelia's life has been really defined by her relationships with boys her love of boys her constant crushes and it's hard for people to accept 
um, and it's hard for her to accept a different idea of herself when she thinks she might be falling for a girl. I think it's an important one and I just think she is a really good writer. Like for a debut, I'm actually really, really impressed and I will probably continue reading from her in the future. Does anyone else who makes videos just like stop filming sometimes halfway through? Just like take a break, go eat lunch, <laughs> come back. I just had a coffee. I realized I'm getting through these too slowly and I'm not actually halfway through and I still have a lot of books to get through. The energy is here. Okay, let's move on to Fall Into Darkness by Christopher Pike. First line, the trial was for murder. Dun dun dun. This is a story of two girls. One of them supposedly pushed her friend off a cliff and the other girl faked her own death. Now, you know, the girl didn't really push her off the cliff. Um, you learn that right away in the story and then you find out like how she planned everything and all of the reveals and I don't, for a book that I reread from like my childhood, this held out more than I thought it would. I thought it was fun. There's some like trial stuff, which is fun. Faking your own murder, fun. I don't know. It was a good time. Um, this is Confessions of a Shopaholic by Sophie Gonzella. The first line is, okay, full line of this is, okay, don't panic, don't panic. It's only a visa bill. And I just think that's an intriguing way to start this because you know that she has gotten herself into some trouble. So we're following Rebecca Bloomwood as she navigates the financial journalist scene, but she has a shopping addiction. I reread this for my childhood thing, watched the movie continue to hate the movie i support you if you like it um four stars there's a little bit of romance less than i remembered but it's a fun little story of a woman getting control of her life then i have this book which is when i'm through with you by stephanie coolen which i gave five stars and the first line is, I didn't pick Rose, by the way, if that's what you're wondering. And I feel like that's intriguing enough. Rose is a character who our main character is in a relationship with. Um, this was from the lowest rated video as well. And I 100% understand the low ratings for this. We're following a main character who isn't enjoyable to read from the perspective of. He's very apathetic. He has some, um, he's a teenager, so he has some like, trauma that he hasn't worked through he doesn't really know why he's acting the way he's acting um and he's you know doing things involved with multiple different people and not respecting himself not respecting his relationship and he's going to tell you the story of their time in the mountains it's like a school trip and it goes from that to this like action adventure survival super high stakes story in the wilderness and it was just so fun and ridiculous and over the top that I had a really good time. Then let's move on to Goddess of Filth by V. Castro which is a possession story. The first line being, I only found ones with saints or Jesus on them. You think they will scare the spirits away? We're following a group of friends who kick off the book with a seance and they have invited some a demon situation into one of the girls. Um, and it's such an interesting perspective because this girl is possessed, um, but she like comes in and out of it. And when she is being possessed, it's like her opportunity to really be her truest self almost and really in tune with her sexuality and her femininity. And these girls are just trying to work together and find out what's wrong and they enlist the help of other people and priests and there's just some interesting conversations in here as far as sexuality again and expectations of women and like um the opportunities um we have a lot of mexican american characters and the things that they're going through the things that they're dealing with just in real life and then obviously also through this like possession moment so i gave it four stars i thought it was interesting i wanted it to be just a little bit darker a little bit more intense but it was kind of a fun one next up i have Nupaming by leanne but a smoke simpson the first line of this has something to do with the pacific one solidification once you move through cold there is pacific that's all there is on the first page and the next page is 
once you move through Pacific, there is Placid. And then on the next page, once you move through Placid, there is a condition of expanse. And it was that condition of expanse that held me. I gave this four stars, but uh, discussing the synopsis is really tough because this doesn't follow like I was gonna say conventional but for, for conventional for my reading like western plot writing rules. I've read a short story collection from her before that I love but I have another thing I really want to read from her. Um, it's a Nishinaabe storytelling in that we have a lot of different characters who all represent different things. I gave this four stars mostly for just like the beautiful language like some of the sentences in here were just I had to read them three times there's a certain amount of research that should accompany this um to get the full experience in my opinion if you are not of the identity of the author I don't know that I can tell you what this book is about um but I can tell you how it feels and there's this feeling of interconnectedness and uh lots of like metaphor so you'll be reading about this story of geese and it's just talking about geese and their migration and it's a beautiful story but it's also about like people and migration and community and decisions there's a great respect i have for this book and a necessity for this book um it is informed by a book from the past by a Canadian author. I talked about it in the vlog how like this book really fights against the ideas that were presented in that book in like the 1850s. Oh it is on the back. It was called Roughing It in the Bush and this is an act of decolonization, de-gentrification, and willful resistance. Next up I have Carrie by Stephen King. This is a weird bind up of The Shining and Carrie. Uh, Carrie is this little one it is about why did i almost say a pyrotechnic it's not about a pyrotechnic it's about a telekinetic character if you don't know the story of carrie she goes to prom gets pig blood spilled on her and then kills everyone the first line of carrie is it was reliably reported by several persons that a rain of stones fell from a clear blue sky on Carlin Street in the town of Chamberlain on August 17th. Well, that's not particularly interesting. Also, the way I read it didn't make it so. I think it's more so the fact that it's from a news article that I find really intriguing because I forgot that Carrie has written um, a lot in like excerpts from books that people have written about Carrie and research papers and newspaper articles. Um, talking about after the fact like what Carrie was as an entity and how it happened and from all different perspectives like what went down on prom night and it's just so interesting it mostly holds up there are some things that I didn't love about it but that's true with every Stephen King uh I gave it four stars did I give it four stars I think I just lied to you and I I kept my five star next up is also five stars how fun this is The New Age of Empire by Kehinde Andrews, how racism and colonialism still rule the world. The first line of this is we urgently need to destroy the myth that the West was founded on the three great revolutions of science, industry, and politics. Now, for some of you, that might not sound like the most intriguing line, but that's like the perfect setup for this whole book's intent of debunking all of these ideas, mainly that slavery and colonialism are not currently affecting like most of the world. Most of the continent of Africa was under direct rule by European powers for a period of less than 100 years. But the West has continued to sustain the exploitative power over Africa and many other places since, just in ways that people might not, some people might not associate with slavery, but is current day slavery. This book is perfectly divided into really easy to understand conversations that all start out with things that you probably are already aware of um, and then dives into the more complex ideas things that are just the way they're phrased you may not have 
considered before. Obviously I'm talking to those like me who don't have like a deep historical knowledge for colonialism. And I just really respect his ability to write a book that feels like anybody could read. This could be like a beginner's entry to this idea, but also for somebody who has like general perspective and an understanding of things, but also for people beyond this scope who probably have a great understanding of this, but can also still like respect his knowledge on the topic and really impressive skill with writing when it is can be like history kind of a dry topic i applaud that book and i think everybody should read it next up we have macbeth first line of this is much better than hamlet because it's thunder and lightning enter three witches macbeth is a story of prophecy it's a story of murder of killing people to gain power but it's never quite that easy. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth will always be some of my favorite characters to read. So that's that. And then I put these together. We've got Me and the Blondes and Better Than Blonde by Teresa Toden, which is about a girl whose father has some secrets. And when she starts a new school, she's determined for a fresh start. Um, but it's all about like vulnerability and this friendship group becoming closer. The first line of the first book is anything is possible in a bus terminal, but I think better than blonde was better. I inhaled so sharply it felt like I'd cut myself, which is just some intense kickoff for middle grade stories or teen stories. I don't really remember the age range. Um, these are weirdly set in the 70s and I feel like that was a strange choice and I don't really have anything to say about them because if you watch that video you know that I have no memory of reading them but I have some things to talk with you about regarding that in my 11th grade video. So look out for that. Next up I have They All Fall Down by Rachel Housel Hall, which is like a retelling of And Then They Were None. And the first line is, the blue scarf caressed my ear as it dipped beneath my head and pulled me down into the water how intense. So this is about a woman who gets invited to be on a reality show, a survival show, but that's not really what's happening. And everybody who got invited uh, is on this boat under false pretenses and they find out why they were really invited. It's a secluded island. There's this giant manor. As far as a retelling goes, it didn't do anything better than the original. And it did quite a few things worse than the original including like character development, inner monologue, um, the villainous monologue and reveals. It didn't do anything like objectively terrible. It just wasn't like good. If I wasn't comparing it to anything else and had no other references, like three stars is where I sit. So that's where I'm staying. Next up, we've got Mercury Boys by Shauna Prasad. And this one, the first line, I forgot that you can see these people. These are the Mercury boys. Um, is obsessions usually begin in a fiery cauldron of anger, jealousy, love, or revenge. But Saskia Browns started in an ordinary high school classroom with bored students and a scuffed linoleum floor. I think that's a good one. I think it's intriguing. Uh, the book itself, not good. This was a two star for me. It had so much potential. This was another lowly rated one and I now understand the low rating uh, and it bums me out. This book didn't know what it wanted to do. I truly don't think it knew what it wanted to be. It was a story about toxic friendship, but it was also like a historical tale, but it also I feel like wanted to be a little romantic and then it wanted to be fantasy because these girls create a club because when they touch mercury and then touch these dragotypes um which is a precursor of the modern day photograph thank you very much um they can like talk to and connect with these men uh from way back in the day and because the story was so messy and didn't feel rooted in any one intent I was just floundering. I was trying to grasp onto something that interested me, but everything was so fleeting. There were a couple opportunities for some fantastic conversations. Um, one being the idea of mortality. When these girls are faced with the idea of life 
doesn't end when you die and you can live forever in a photograph like the fact that they didn't go beyond the idea of eternal life or even pondering it beyond that that one little moment where this one girl thought about it like what a missed opportunity and then there's also this idea of saskia being a woman of color and entering um this scene in the past and she talks about like she shouldn't be accepted here and she has to be really careful and it could have turned into a different like type of story but then that just got glossed over really quickly and then like one of the or some of the girls it's weird because it's like they want to be friends with these boys but they maybe want to date these men and like it could have turned into an epic romance too not that i'm supporting that idea but it could have but it was mostly just like this toxic friendship story about the girls like going behind each other's backs lying to each other to like get to visit their mercury boys and it could have gotten way darker and way more intense and then like no storyline ever felt finished it was a real challenge to read i'm so sad about it because this is like my perfect concept reality with supernatural weirdness just coming into real life and people just having to like deal with this new information and changing your entire perspective on the world but then nothing happened next up we've got razor blade tears by s.a cosby and the first line of this one is ike tried to remember a time when men with badges coming to his door early in the morning brought anything other than heartache and misery but try as he might nothing came to mind that is such a good first sentence it's super intriguing it's a good setup it establishes like who this character is what he's been through but in like a vague kind of way and i'm so sad to tell you that this was only a two two and a half star for me i wanted to like this so much obviously it's the literally dead book club pick for february um it goes outside of ideas that a lot of like the typical mystery thrillers that i read present and this book had a lot of good things to say this isn't something that i look at and think i hated it it did something wrong it's about these two men ike who we just met and buddy lee and their sons were married um, but neither of them really supported them at all and after their sons experienced hate crimes and were murdered they decide to go on this journey of revenge they have nothing to lose like the setup is so good and it feels like kind of a moment of retribution for these men um but they do acknowledge like multiple times in the book that this doesn't absolve them from what they've done um the lack of good parenting the lack of involvement in their lives um their sons even had a, a child and she is in the story um unfortunately like the way that she's used and other characters are used i just don't feel like this met its full potential and i was expecting a good portion of this like when everyone was so in love with it last year and the people that i saw loving it i almost expected there to be i did expect there to be like a portion of this from the son's perspectives um, us getting to know them and seeing their lives that their fathers missed out on but it wasn't that at all um, and that's fine because that's not what the book pitched itself to be that's just me going in with certain expectations it was really just an action adventure story it was a shootout it was 300 pages of you know going from place to place talking to person to person threatening every person that they met um which is fair these characters are you know morally gray they're willing to do whatever it takes to find out the truth this feels like it's for dads um of a certain age who grew up in a certain time and need to confront perhaps their own you know biases overall it was too like predictable and fast paced but that's when i can absolutely understand people loving especially like if you're a fan of you know harlan coben james patterson linwood barkley like that vibe but this is that vibe with the addition of conversations that you might not have in those other books so that's great next up i have the last final girl by stephen graham jones which was a huge win for me I can't remember if I gave this oh yeah four and a half stars because it didn't feel like a full five star because it got a little bit confusing but I'm also kind of okay with it uh this is one of the most uniquely written books I've ever read because it reads like um a transcript it reads like a 
like a script um, of like the camera movements of a horror movie and the editing and the music and it's about the serial killer Billie Jean who wears a Michael Jackson mask that's like the iconic serial killer in here and we have a bunch of characters like surviving competing to be the last final girl I guess and it was just really interesting it literally talks like a wide grimy blade cuts into a neck hard before we can look away the blood welling up black around the meat the sound wicked and intimate that's the first line of this and it really sets the tone because the whole book is like that it talks like before we can process the scene the camera moves to this other position slow ominous music comes in over the shoulder of this character we see this other character and it's just so unique and interesting and I loved it so much I've never disliked a Stephen Graham Jones and if there's one to dislike it's this because it's so strange um I think there is a live show for this saw it in my feed um so i will link that down below next up we have finley donovan knocks him dead i put this in my second position for first line oh yeah because the first line is christopher was dead don't worry it's not a major character it's not a spoiler even though this is the sequel to finley donovan is killing it um christopher is a pet in Finley Donovan the series we're following this woman who's an author and she is in a Panera Bread and someone overhears her talking about the plot of her book and thinks that she is a hit woman and hires her and she gets stuck in all of these hijinks in the first book um she has like an accomplice their duo team is very fun in this one we learn more about like that sidekick character and I gave it four stars it's not quite as fun or interesting as the first one not quite as like romantic but I thought it was a good series continuation and I will continue reading more I can't specifically talk too much about the plot in here um if you haven't read the first one but it continues to be over the top and ridiculous and laugh out loud funny the last book my very favorite intro line was my least favorite book of the month and that's what should be wild by julia fine which breaks my heart because i thought i would love this they grow me inside of my mother which was unusual because she was dead like the setup is just so good this girl has been stuck inside forever and when she touches things stuff happens um and so she's been really kept away from society and instead of like exploring that and her new introduction to the world and her like innocence and naivete you know being preyed upon or her growing like it's just this weird story of her just like walking through the woods falling in love with this boy and just like talking about stories that she's been told and then we read some stories of her ancestors and like half the book isn't her story half of it is these characters that we only see for their chapter and we just hear about their lives like her ancestors and they're again I feel like missed opportunity is a feeling that I have a lot and I don't know if that's like a mean phrase but that's how I feel about this book as a whole like the setup is so intriguing but I don't think that this author knew what she even wanted to do with the book I think she had this great idea and then it went absolutely nowhere I thought we were gonna have ties between all of these characters that were a little more explained and that we got to see this thread and that we got I was really expecting some great reveals because a book like this often has this connection that you don't see until the author tells you I just feel like this synopsis is wrong like it's it's not about her reckoning with her power and coming to understand the wildest parts of herself it doesn't even talk about the fact that half the book isn't about Maisie at all Maisie encounters a strange world filled with wonder and deception I just don't think that that's accurate and it confuses me because like the back the blurbs are so glowing and I'm just like did we read the same book I'm obviously missing something pretty imperative to the enjoyment of this book because so many people love it but at the same time it is one of the most lowest rated books like on Goodreads I think there are way too many characters I think this is one of the most disjointed and aimless narratives that I have read and it's like the story itself 
feels like it wants to be whimsical but the writing is so takes itself so seriously that there's no room to enjoy like the fun and like beautiful surrounding because it's just so like straightforward and serious and it was a confusing time for me last time i did my wrap up i started with my least favorite book and this time i ended with my least favorite book and i don't actually know which is worse now because <laughs> either i kick off the video negatively or now i'm in a negative mindset for the rest of my day just kidding let's leave this on good vibes um i you're here and i'm here and we're here together and we got to hang out and i hope that that's a positive experience for you even if i don't like some books this was such a weird reading month for me i read a lot um and a lot of it was like one two stars and five stars so my emotions were just all over the place and i'm glad i got to talk them through with you uh let me know if you've read any of these and what you thought or if you're planning on reading them now or if i dissuaded you from reading them and i'll see you later thank you so much for being here bye